four, three, two, and one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Art of Move podcast with myself, Anthony Manuel, my good friend, Dr. William Raybar, out here in the Canadian Rockies. And we are joined today by the one and only Go to Bam. Go to where are you joining us from today? I'm in New Orleans. Nice. Uh, New Orleans at the, at the Go to Headquarters home base. Very nice. So we uh, we had a, quite a few people stoked to uh, to join in here. I'm going to give some people to join, give some people some time to join in live. We do these live on No Filter Net where you can actually interact in the chat, and you can even hit the knock button, ask to join on the stream yourself if you want to chat with our guests. But uh, Bam, we're really stoked to talk to you about the Goda lifestyle. Talk to you about how you got into Goda, how you discovered it, what your background was before Goda. And uh, just your experience in living a lifestyle as a mover, someone who is living in their body and who is just, you know, living and moving <laughs> pain free. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. the reason that I, I go ahead, Dr. Dr. Oh, Will. Sure. Sorry about that. I, I cut you off there. I just want to do a uh, kind of jump into it because of the time constraint. Um, I know that you were mentioning before from all the things that I've watched that you're hypermobile and I just wanted to know how you got into Gota and how you solved your own issues, um, you know, pain, mm -hmm. uh, lifestyle issues even, and how I want to see it from like the internal cueing end of it, of things, if you know what I mean. So you know, yeah. get as deep as you want. There. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty hyper mobile guy. Uh, I think I just have been, I stayed limber since, a, since early age, started out doing gymnastics um, when I was doing like a lot of youth sports and then quickly transitioned to jujitsu around 15 and was also a floor dweller. Uh, really liked being on the floor, could sleep outside, could sleep on the, on the ground. So was never uncomfortable with being on the ground and, and preferred being on the ground when I was at home. And then so I came into jujitsu at age 15 with an already pretty flexible and mo mobile body than you could imagine what uh, maybe eight years on the mat would do to a body in terms of the different shapes that you kind of can create. So martial arts was the first real big uh, movement practice that I engaged in, even though I was constantly on the move as a kid, just kind of ADD, just move, 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 move was a, the happiest that I felt. So kind of just pursued joy and happiness that way and found myself moving a lot. But martial arts was the first time that I really dove into like a very specific movement practice and had to develop a certain capacities, techniques, and skills that were not available to me. And so when I learned uh, through martial arts that, you know, you know, after you go into a gym, like a martial arts gym, and you're a white belt on day one, and everyone can beat you, and everyone knows how to submit you and toss you around like a rag doll, whether you're like a, a smaller guy like myself or a larger guy, um, but then after like maybe three, three months is like the usual mark that I've witnessed that after about three months on the mat with somebody that all of a sudden they have some skills and some aptitude, uh, maybe for a new person that's in the gym and you're like, hold on, like a month ago, I was literally bottom of the barrel, but now because I've learned some skills and practiced some techniques, integrated them into my movement system. Now I have, like, I can do whatever I was doing. So I took that kind of same level of understanding that athleticism is something that you can you can learn. You can learn kinesthetic awareness. You can learn athleticism. You can develop different physical attributes, really whatever you want. Um, and if you're willing to show up every day for that, then you can really change yourself uh, in a big time in the way that you move through the world and how your body looks uh, and the quality of your movement. So I became obsessed, um, so to speak with just that process of engaging in martial arts, martial arts turned into uh, like CrossFit, Olympic weightlifting, uh, endurance swimming, uh, rescue swimming, running, uh, like it's kind of gone all over the place. Usually what happens is I get nervous to engage in a new practice, like fighting somebody was really scary to me. So I'm like, I want to dive into that. There's a challenge there for me to like, I must, I'm afraid of that because that's something that's not in my wheelhouse right now. So when I feel like there's something that's outside of my wheelhouse, outside of that comfort zone, I usually want to kind of step into that. Uh, so I did find myself uh, when I was in my early 20s wanting to challenge myself in a new way. And I decided I wanted to be uh, 
do uh, pursue a career as an Air Force special operator. So with the special operations in the military, they have got a list of standards running, swimming, uh, calisthenics, push-ups, pull-ups, and a bunch of different other things that they're going to put you through. And at the time that I wanted to do this, I had been a competitive, competitive Olympic weightlifter, have been doing a ton of martial arts, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, Muay Thai, MMA, as well as um, CrossFit and just kind of general movement, uh, so to speak. So the joining like the military and doing more of a special operations thing seemed like something that was outside of my comfort zone and outside of my ability. Right when I started training specifically for this job, the the running requirements, I was like, I found out really soon that I was way beyond the mark of the running requirements. It was like a mile and a half um, and under something like 10, 40 or maybe 10 to 20 at one time. So it's like around, let's say, uh, a six minute mile pace for about a mile and a half. And that was kind of like the bare minimum. Like you don't want to show up and just like just make the mark. And, you know, they wanted you to be able to do this test over and over and over again. Um, so when I had made up my mind that I wanted to pursue this route, uh, I was like, I can't even, I can't even make, make the run time. Push-ups, like could do like 85 to 100 in two minutes. Pull-ups, got up to 20 pull-ups in a minute. Swimming, was a really strong swimmer in the water. Like strong, swimming was my strong suit. But then when I went to go run, uh, my friends would like, they would watch me run on the track and they would be like, dude, something's wrong with you. And I'm like, I know, like, I know something's wrong. Like, it doesn't feel right. I wouldn't have pain, but the harder that I tried to run, the harder the run felt. It felt like death. And like trying to creep out um, like a 730 minute mile time, like it felt like it felt like death. And at that time when I was doing that, I would I would do like two hour Olympic weightlifting session on Friday, maxing out snatch, maxing out clean and jerk. And then I'd go to the gym, the fighting gym, and I do two hours of open mat, which is just nonstop grappling back to back to back. So I could do two hours of a weightlifting session, go into two hours of jujitsu. And, but then when I went on the track, my body just like broke down for something as simple as like a, a max mile time or, or a mile time that's like decently fast. Uh, so my friends and, uh, and even my family saw my how my physical aptitude for weightlifting, for swimming in the water, for being on the mats. At the time, I even uh, owned my own strength conditioning gym. So how I moved in all these spaces was like advanced, high level. And then when I went to one of the most basic of places, like a running track or just running on the street with people, people would just be like, dude, something's wrong. Uh, and, I, and I knew it too. So I, I started looking for running coaches to help me. And every single running coach that I went to would give me just a different running program. And I'd be like, okay, now I'm just, here's just more running. But the, my running feels like, feels wrong but you're just telling me just to run more and then just let it like work itself out oh do these exercises maybe do these like a skips and b skips or kind of you know so i was kind of lost in the weeds uh and then i saw an instagram post the that coach gill gilly go to loco ran which was uh go to joe next to the baby and it was kind of doing this the crawling motion and right when i saw that i was like oh they get it. <laughs> they get it. And I reached out to Gilly. Uh, I recently sent sent him my like my slip into his DM. Like, I was like, hey, do you do online training? It wasn't like, dude, this looks crazy. Like, what's going on? I was like, Jay, do you do online training? And he, and I told him like, hey, I'm you know trying to go in the military. And he was like, yeah, let's get you uh, let's get you assessed. So I sent him my assessment, and he broke it down. Hey, man, you're you're inside ankle went low. You don't got a bow on your right side, and you're moving in reverse. And I was like, oh, thank God. Like, this is, it was music to my ears because there was this thing that I was trying to do. I had a specific time frame. You know, I was, there was to be these tests that would be run every three months. So I was always on a three month thing. Like, I need to get this down right now. Um, so when I was given those answers, uh, you know, my, my mile and a half run time, just to give you an idea, was around 1140, 1145, uh, horribly slow, horribly slow. And then Gilly told me about inside ankle bone high. 
and I spent two weeks just working on my ankles and I went back to the run and then it, my run was like at 1120, like no problem. And I stopped running and I just worked on my ankles. And then he got me how to set a bow and like get into my back chain. And then my, and then I went to like a 1050 and then I was like, okay. And that was after two sessions with Gilly online. There were maybe like 30 minutes. He's like, Hey, you're inside ankle bone low. You got to fix that. And I see it like visually. And I think about my martial arts days when heel hooks and all the different times when my ankle would be in that position. And I'm like, yeah, of course I never would want it to be in that position. I stay safe by getting, you know, here, here was my position of safety. I knew that if any, if anyone wanted to get me out of my position of safety, they're going to reach on the inside and do something like that. That's how you would manipulate my legs. But I always knew that if I collect myself from the outside to the inside, that was like, I was safe. I could do all my work from there. So the, the mental translation was like instantly, I was like, got it. Okay, I'm gonna go away for a couple couple weeks and figure this out. Um, uh, then eventually uh, got my runtime down really good. Ran my fastest mile, you know, maybe a year and a half later. That was six. It was like six thirteen or something. Which when it was like, okay, now we're like in the seven fifty, seven twenty, six fifty, six forty five, and it was consistently down there. You know, I had ran a sub like maybe a seven minute mile in high school, but it was always like, I would just like, you know, hold on for dear life and just run this thing. And I knew, I knew intuitively that a seven minute mile should be my standard. I should be able to wake up, just go run a seven minute mile. And like within three to five minutes, be relatively like fine to hold a conversation. No big deal. Be able to do it again. I knew that if I could, if I was like, straining with everything to run a seven minute mile that something was wrong um and i could feel it in my body and it's just what happens when reverse movement becomes a default movement pattern and uh, for people who are listening who, who might not understand what that cue is can you define the traits of what reverse movement is yeah it's just when you're you're loading pressure on the inside of your your lower legs your foot um, especially all the way up the chain of your leg. So you're loading on the inside when you land. And then when you leave, you're kicking it to the outside, kicking to the outside. The best way to describe this is like if I'm swimming, you know, when I think about reverse movement, reverse forward movement, if I'm swimming in the water, I don't push my hand forward and then pull it backwards to get myself into the water. I don't go to the inside and then pull to the outside. I come from the outside, I dive inside, and I just continue that that motion for swimming. Everyone can understand that if I do this in the water, I go one way. If I do this in the water, I go the other way. Well, it's really the same thing. Now we're just on two feet with gravity, just doing the same kind of motion out to in, out to in. So it makes sense that when I try to turn the volume up, sprint louder, I was just moving in reverse harder, which is like mm. it made so much sense because sometimes I would just go on an easy run and be like, yo, I just hit like a whatever run and I wasn't even trying. But then when I would try, when I would actively try and engage myself and be like, I'm doing the thing, the most aggressive default movement pattern that I was training at the time, which was heavy Olympic weightlifting, heavy martial arts, which has a lot of reverse movement in it. That was what came out because that was my conscious use of my body at that time. So I have a couple questions about that. Um, in martial arts, could you give an example of reverse movement? And also, um, on the jujitsu end, is there something now that you've taken from Gota or a lot that you've taken from Gota and wish you would have known when you did jujitsu? Yeah, um, in terms of, of, the, of the, the reverse movement with jujitsu, a lot of it is just the positioning that happens. And there is, you know, just you're in a fight. You're, you're like in a fight. You're not just walking forward or just running forward. Like you're in a fight for your life at times. You know, I've had some some wars on the mats, wars in like the ring. And so you, you're going all kinds of places. Gota is about forward movement. So to to expect that you go into a martial arts cage or, or a jujitsu mat and that you're going to maintain go to, you're going to be moving all the time. That means that you're going to be in forward spirals all the time. But there's a lot of times when somebody is moving you in a forward spiral in order to break the spiral you kick out in reverse or you suplex them, you know, you stop the forward movement and you go reverse and that's going to get you some kind of positioning, uh, some kind of advantage or maneuver 
Um, even I was talking to a guy recently, his hip flexors were all messed up because in, in Muay Thai, you want to check kick. So you bring your knee up to the outside elbow. So your knee comes up, you, you know, you flex your knee. Well, in a, in a one, running or walking gait, the knee always flex with, flexes and comes up within the corner, comes up to the inside like that. So when you go against the grain of the forward movement, you throw your knee out and then you just do a bunch of, of checks. And he's like, man, my hip flexor is just pissed off and it's not like letting go. So it's a matter of seeing the the environment that I was in jujitsu. If I did have a go to coach, I would see the environment. I see the skills that I needed to. And then I would say, OK, do I have to do this check like this? Or is there a way that I can modify this to where it's not going to batter my hip? A lot of times you can't modify. It. It's a technique because that's the most effective way to do it. So then it says, OK, I thrash my hip like this when I do a Muay Thai class. What is the way that I'm going to get this hip to decompress? And so that I can go back home, walk around my house, and I'm not going to be all bound up and tight. What I notice most of the time is that there's going to be a minimal warm up going into an environment where there's going to be a life and death battle. You know, there's people that are literally trying to put you in reverse torque movement places to submit you and take your joints to the end range. They're going to try and put you as max inside ankle bone low, or they're trying to make your knee go as valgus so that they could reap your knee and get, you know, get a knee bar on you. Like that's, that's what the name of the game with fighting is like trying to put somebody's body against the grain. Um, so after the fact, you incur a lot of just micro little damages and Goda gives us a really good understanding that, hey, man, even every single time I step and it goes like that, that's just a little bit of unnecessary compression force that my body has to eat and deal with. That compression force is going to result in some kind of tension, some kind of overuse is going to be felt in the muscles. It could be felt in the joints. It could be felt in just general stiffness or immobility. But the body has to take that and like kind of funnel it to some way. So even something as simple as stepping and, and letting the ankles collapse, well, if I go into class and somebody's just arm barring me over and over and over again, or we're, we're practicing heel hooks and it's just inside ankle bone low, inside ankle bone low, inside ankle bone low, I'm going to take that information in as, okay, I'm practicing my sport. And then afterwards, I'm going to be like, okay, let me feed my body what I do want, which is inside ankle bone high back chain dominance. That's going to decompress me. It's going to be my cleanup system so that I can go back on the mats tomorrow. Uh, where a lot of people don't they just go back home to the couch and that kind of all that compression that they incurred in that time from somebody else or their own movement patterns just kind of solidifies in their body and they slowly just get more and more bound up and you see the same postures that a lot of fighters their bodies kind of morph into and then by the time they're in their 40s late 30s early 40s then you know their their time on the mats is like done like they're you know, it's rare to find somebody who's 50, 50 plus, who's been in the game for a long time, who isn't injured and completely out because, oh, my back or, oh, my neck or, or something. It's, to me, it's a, it's a little unfortunate. So you reached out to Gil and he helped you clean up your run. You started getting the faster run times. You cleaned everything up and it, it clicked instantly for you. Hey, and did you end yeah. up going, get, did you get that military job in the end? Did you end up following through with it? Yes, I, I smashed the, uh, I ended up smashing the, uh, the tests. Um, probably the, the coolest one was that, and this was a process too, you know, it was maybe 2020, 2021, and I came in at 2019. So there was a lot of recoding that I was having to do. And I was living this recode and like trying to actively do this for um, the first year I hit it super hard, super hard. Um, but it was a while to like where the way the quality of my movement now um i have worked hard for for that for the abilities that i have um and still have a lot more to do but i ended up doing uh, pretty well on the tests my last test that i did i had to do like a last minute uh, retake of the test and this one was really special to me and was a testament to go to because I drove in a car 40 minutes to go meet uh, the recruiter at the location. And it was like a one-off. There was like one thing that was missing in my test. So like my last test that I trained for and prepped for, and I slept well for, and I ate well for, and I did a, a beautiful warm up for, that test was null and void. So when I went to go do this retake, he kind of met up with me on a one-off. 
I got out of the truck after being in the in the truck for 40 minutes, woke up, put put like a little bit of oatmeal in my mouth, got in the truck, 40 minutes, got out to the location. I make, maybe did like a few like little go to stretches. And then he's like, you ready to work? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we just jumped right into the t into the test cold uh, and I was able to pass it and feel really strong with it. And now I was like, OK, that that to me was like a huge uh, relief for me because I wanted these capacities and I wanted these capacities without having to like really strain for them, but just being like natural within my body to where I could just wake up and be like, yeah, like, let's go on a six mile run and I'm, I'm going to feel fine. I'm going to be okay. It might suck a little bit, but like, um, my movement quality is going to be good. So, um, in your own practice and how you practice on a daily basis, uh, I'm going to give you an example. When I try to move complex, if I don't feel it that day, I'll just do more and more go to, and then maybe I get there or maybe I don't. Some days I feel good and, uh, and I'll be in those patterns that I want to be in. Then I go do my activity. Is it similar for you or is there a structured way that you do it? Uh, no, it's very feeling based, uh, very feeling based for me in my body and just an understanding, you know, from the understanding that slow motion video gives you, you're like, okay, these are my weak areas or these are my consistencies. These are my patterns. After you've been in the, in the recode mindset for a while, you see the patterns that repeat in your life over time, over a longer cycle. Um, those patterns look like, okay, when I get stressed out, front chain dominance comes in my life because I stop going on the ground. I start sitting more or I stop, you know, doing my recode or it's like, um, you know, inside ankle bone high, uh, low comes in, in and how do I work with these things? But they're, they overall become general sensations that invite you to go back into the cycle of the recode, which is, you know, okay, I did a, a long plane ride. And I'm just feeling tight, just feeling kind of like stuck in my body. But you just go back into the, the go to cycle, which is like, yo, let's decompress you, decompress the body, number one. Okay, I decompress the body, then I reintroduce groundwork and shape work. So I get my mixture, my shapes to right. And then I use the ground to kind of solidify myself. I work from my ground, then I might do some more standing stuff. Then from standing stuff, I might do some more like fluidity. And then I'm going to go about whatever it is I want to do. And that cycle is like, both a micro and a macro cycle that for some time when you first start your recode, you might have to decompress solely just for a long time and then just do a bunch of groundwork and then do just a bunch of standing and shape work um, and then take it into fluidity. And that could be a process like you could spend one or two months in each one of those blocks. But then in a small cycle, like a daily little recode, you're going to have that decompress, reintroduce the ground, reintroduce back chain dominance, strong shapes inside the ankle bone high, strong columns, take it to some standing stuff, some fluidity, and then maybe go on a run. And that could be anywhere from a five minute cycle to man, today I'm recoding for an hour, but it's very much feeling and kinesthetically led, not necessarily like I need, I'm going to do my run at, at this time and my recode is, you know, 20 rockers and this and then this. It's like, no, I feel my right hip is in the front chain and I'm going to work this right hip with all the different tools that go to gives me so I can decompress it and feel that my bow is there and then it's opening up. And once I feel like it's good, do a little bit of fluidity drills and be like, OK, yeah, we're, we're ready to take this for a ride and then go for that. Um, but that's really empowering for somebody like myself who wants to move all the time because it's like it's working with the body actively, showing up every day to the body, checking in with the body, what's going on and listening to the body's cues and sensations and saying this is available to me today or it's not. And what would be good is this. And I always feel like the body's going to lead you to this would be good. Maybe you do want to go on a run. But hey, I actually really just want you to be on the ground doing rockers for 30 minutes. And that's what you actually need. So what you know, we, we've had a few go to coaches on and the one word that I hear you saying more than the other coaches have talked about is the word decompression. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the principles of posture and locomotion have been talked about, but this idea of decompression is something that uh, we haven't really covered a lot on, on this podcast yet. Um, from the perspective of someone who did a lot of Olympic lifting, right? I could like, I was a power lifter, both Will and I did a ton of CrossFit and the compression that I found was obviously in the spine, the hips. Uh, 
I'm recently trying to figure out like how to decompress my ankles after having, you know, a heavy barbell and literally just pushing all that weight directly into through my heels and compressing my ankles. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to approach decompression for someone who has spent years and years literally compressing their body, is it movement based or is there another approach that you like to take and that you had to take, for example, to mm -hmm. decompress some of that compressive uh, weightlifting work? Yeah, I think this is where the conversation between, you know, somebody who's hypermobile versus somebody uh, who's chronically tight. Um, that's where this conversation comes in. Like, OK, we need to we know we need to decompress your body. You know, you work with a go to coach and it was like, yeah, we need to decompress your body. There's some people that, you know, uh, can't get can't get on all fours without their hips pinching. That's a huge red flag that your hips are so compressed in the front chain. And that even being on all fours on the ground is causing some red flags. I'm like, get on your back, put your legs on a wall and just breathe for 30 minutes until those puppies just sit into your back socket. For someone like me and coming from the jujitsu world, it was like I, I had all the access to the shapes of Goda, all the access to the shapes of a Woda body or just like the reverse, like both shapes. You know, I would actively give somebody my arm so they would put me in an arm bar like this so that I could roll over my shoulder to get out of it. You know, I put myself into compromising positions where people thought I was going to be, you know, be vulnerable, but I would utilize my flexibility and over flexibility myself and uh, to get an upper hand. So what I found for myself, you know, being on the hypermobile side, the decompression happened when I brought certain tensions into the body. When I really focused on the principles, okay, back chain dominance, I don't need to decompress into the back chain because I can, you know, reach down, put my hands on the ground like I'm fine. I needed to learn how to pressurize the back chain, pressurize my hips as they're going into more of a corners and then do my forward fold, which felt like a one rep max, you know, stretching. It felt like when I was putting myself in the back chain, I wanted weight. I wanted like a weight vest on to really feel how to create true back chain pressure. I wanted to feel how to create super inside ankle bone high. So I was like, I need to move a lot. I need to pressurize my body a lot and do it in a lot of different ways because I knew there was more of a neurological situation going on with me more than like a tissue situation where some people it's a tissue thing. It's a time thing. We need to spend a bunch of time in some different shapes and let your tissues, your joints, your bones adapt to this new shape. Where for me, I was like Gumby, like I could do so many different things. Um, you can even see it like when I crawl, there's like so much movement happening that I'm starting to have the conversation, have been having the conversation of where are the places where I want to restrict movement or keep it contained, contained is a better word, and where are the places where I want movement to be fluid and free. Yeah, it's super cool. So that, Go ahead. So that must be a very uh, feeling-based way to do it. Um, I kind of wanted to to ask you, what is your favorite go-to, go-to exercise? Like something that you always go back to and it's your one maneuver that really helps your body. Um, at first, it was drop-ins. Drop-ins, when I first found drop-ins, it was, it was drop-ins. Uh, now it's rockers. And what I have found that also that movement will change. It's like this year I'm doing drop-ins and I'm, I'm just doing like drop-ins, drop-ins. Like when I first found Goat, it was like drop-in city every day, like 400 drop-ins. And then, you know, it changed into uh, something else. Right now it's rockers. Right now I love rockers. I love how I'm feeling with rockers. My rockers now versus my rockers in 2019 feel and look completely different. Uh, which is something that's interesting when you do the recode, like let's say you do decompress your hips in a big time way. Well, the wall sit that you were doing a month ago feels completely different than the wall sit that you're doing now because there's all this different new space, new sensations, like new asks that your body has for you. So when, when people see child rockers, I have a hard time explaining what the benefit of them is. It's like people are like, why are you doing so many of those? And other than saying, well, it feels awesome, <laughs> how would you explain to someone, like, what does a child rocker do to get you more in a space where you're apt to behave in a go-to way? Uh, I, you know, it's just a, a big conversation on the rock itself. 
um, which is a skill. And it's the opposite of a thrust, which is like, that's mm. also a skill. But everyone's thrusting, kettlebell swings, you know, um, barbell back squats, Olympic weightlifting. Uh, you see it in, in martial arts, like deadlifting, like almost all of these modern veins of exercises, when you look at it and you keep looking at it, it's like, that's another hip thrust. Like we're still hip thrusting. And, you know, we wonder why people are having back pain. So really when we do child rockers, uh, drop-ins, they all are a version of a rock. They all fall under the, the umbrella of rocking, not a hip thrust. It's a rock. And a rock is the opposite of a thrust. A thrust is when you engage your hips to the front chain and then kind of relax to the back chain. Engage to the front and then relax to the back chain. The rock is when we do the opposite. We engage to the back chain. We come forward a little bit, you know, as if you're just beginning, it'll just be like a relaxed forward, but then you learn how to engage in the back chain, keep the back chain and go forward. So the rock is a general skill set, a capacity that go to teaches of how to move your hips back and engage your back chain, where for a lot of people, when they first move their hips back, they're like, um, I don't know, or even worse, they move their hips back and their quads and their hip flexors, like turn on for dear life like oh no like we don't we don't know how to hold you up back here it's exactly what happened to me and still happens to this day i find I, I can find the back chain better standing up than i can in child rockers so I'm, I'm definitely doing something off there my quads just light up right away but i wanted to bring it back to almost a similar question i asked you earlier about jujitsu except bring it into striking so for me i i'm into boxing and my right hand used to suck. It, it would have no power. And it was because I was pushing off. Basically, I was going straight onto my big toe and I would get no force out of that, as, no matter how hard I tried. Yeah. As soon as I started hitting that strong side of the foot, I was throwing bombs out of my right hand. Also, the overhead right, I was trying to figure it out, could never do it. All I needed to do was internal cue landing in a bow. And all of a sudden, my right hand just turned on like this. Yeah. I think subconsciously, I was afraid of being in balance or off balance when I was landing. So the bow was actually the way to get my right hand much mm -hmm. stronger. I didn't need to do anything else. Right. So is there a cue that you see in yourself or with other fighters that you're like, Oh, if you just did this, it would make it so much better. You know, I, I when I'm working with fighters, like in a fighter stance is a, uh, it's a touchy subject, especially if they've been fighting for a while. So you, so with something like that, you know, you could have the conversation of like, let's change up your stance, but they've got a wrestling game. Are they doing Muay Thai? Are they doing boxing? So they can have more of a straight feet. There's so many uh, variables. The number one thing is that you see a lot of fighters with some really bad feet, like super bad feet. Um, and, the, and I think the reason for that is, does it, number one, it's part of the culture that we got right now with sneakers and, and hardwood surfaces and not being able to walking for a long time. So you have that. And then on top of that, you layer your training environment, which is on a, a soft padded wrestling mat. And that soft padded wrestling mat is like when you're wearing those running shoes with a huge cushion that only starts to mitigate the sensory input of the pressures that are coming into your body and the, and the forces that you're putting into your foot. So the mat kind of makes that really quiet. Whereas if you were like in Japan on just little bamboo sheets, like you would feel like when you go inside ankle bone low, you like start to go inside ankle bone high. You'd start to work on the outside edge because loading on the inside edge on a hard surface over and over again sucks. So it's the <laughs> mat and the um, and then the last one is the martial arts because you're on and off the mats all day. There's a huge flip flop culture and flip flops for anyone that doesn't know because the you know the strap is in in between the big toe and that that second toe. If you did corner you feel like your flip-flop is going to fly off. Like when somebody runs and they have flip-flops on, you just see them like just flip, like fly the first thing that happens. So it's difficult to maintain the flip-flop contact with the foot. So you actively have to squeeze. And in order to maintain it, it like teaches you how to pull your foot up and kick your foot to the outside as you're coming in for your reset in your corner. So it teaches reverse movement. So it's like a combination of flip-flop culture uh, being on soft surfaces that don't give you the right kind of feedback for your feet that when you see these guys in the ring, you know, they've got just a lot of collapsed arches, a lot of bad feet. Um, and people are exploiting that right now. The low calf kick is really making a huge round in the martial arts world where guys are just hitting low calf kicks. When I was 
uh, training a bunch and doing uh, Muay Thai, it was you hit on the inside of the thigh next to the VMO because that's a big nerve area, or you give them a dead leg right on the outside IT band. We know that sucks and that hurts. The inside uh, thigh hurts. But now people are kicking like the lower calf right here, and they're realizing that if you take this out, it's not a dead leg. It's like now you don't have any way to load the outside edge, which means your explosivity, your ability to move is just gone. Like you said, like mm. you take away somebody's outside edge, even throwing a punch. Um, so I'm really excited for this awareness to come into the martial arts world because, you know, working, working out your feet and being conscious of your feet, it just really takes that awareness piece. And then once you have that awareness piece, you can do a few different exercises, throw the flip flops in the trash, you know, get some nice sandals um, and then save your legs from those low calf kicks, but then also really like stay athletic in the ring. Super cool. Um, are you involved in any martial arts other than training martial artists now, or are you pretty much pure go to movement practice? Uh, not currently right now. Uh, it's, it's, it's pure go to at the, at the moment. Uh, just really engrossed in that process and really enjoying that process and getting into running. Uh, but I think martial arts and martial arts training is going to be something that's with me uh, throughout my entire life just because of what it means to me in, in the community and, and what fighting uh, does for, for me as a person. So is there a martial artist that uh, exemplifies, you know, Gota or who's your favorite martial artist in terms of movement? Um, I really like watching Stylebender and Anderson Silva. So like these longer, lankier guys that aren't so like trying to power but they want to move and be really precise with their movement. A lot of times when you see guys that are like that, have really clean movement techniques, really good handwork, they're gonna have a lot more go-to qualities within their body. The guys that are more uh, power-based or wrestling-based, you're gonna see a lot more of the, the reverse movement because they put themselves in more of that lifting engine versus somebody who's been kind of on their feet and just really wants to stay at a distance and then just you know, catch you out real quick. For sure. Cool. How did, how did you make the transition from getting recoded and, and, you know, improving your run and doing all this stuff? How did you make the transition into being a go-to coach yourself? Um, I think once you, once you see the, the go to map or the singularity, then it's really hard not to be a go-to coach. You know, even if you aren't a certified go-to coach, once you kind of see it, then I'm like, at Christmas, I'm like, Grams, you know, let's get out of these slippers here. Let's do a little ankle work, you know. Let's make sure you're balanced. This gets you a little in your back chain. Maybe my language is way different, but you see someone who, like, is just standing poorly or moving poorly, and just with a little bit of awareness, you can kind of really have a big impact on their quality of movement life. Um, so right when I, I first started, uh, it was difficult for me not to try and be a coach. And being a coach is, I think, uh, something that you choose to do, choose to choose to help somebody, choose to put yourself at the service of somebody else, uh, which is, I think, really what a go-to coach is doing, is trying to improve the quality of movement of somebody's life. And I really believe that when you improve the quality of your movement, you will improve the quality of your life. Like, they will correlate just immediately we don't really always understand that but it's it's true the quality of my movement comes up the quality of my life comes up and which is some simple things like back chain dominance inside ankle bone high even just getting yourself standing in your columns feet straight could do some crazy things for your life um so i really started uh speaking about this uh, right when i found it and then in january of last year uh, started working with go to full time and working as a coach full time. Yeah. So, um, what aspect of go to, do you find the most difficult to, uh, get into somebody's awareness? You know, everyone's pretty much coming from the lifting world or from a different paradigm. So for me being a chiropractor, it's really hard for, you know, to, uh, to talk to other professionals and they're like, where's the controlled study or something like that. Right. I'm sure that doesn't exactly happen in your world, but there must be a piece of Goda that is harder to explain than others. Yeah. Um, because I work with just a lot of normal people, 
I love talking to just normal people, mom on the street, you know, normal kids, just like everyday people um, is who I really care about affecting, affecting the the quality of movement on a global scale. You know, I think about all the kids right now um, in chairs, all the people in high school in chairs, all the PE t classes that are taught, all the different sports programs, like just normal everyday people that want to move that don't really have access to this information. So when this information is presented to them, it looks like another training system. It looks like, oh, this is just like another thing that I should add on top of my life that is gonna like help me improve or give me some kind of result. It's like an exogenous medication that I take that's gonna give me like a result. Just like, okay, I go to the gym, I get muscles or something. And the conversation of Gota and what Gota really is, is a, it's wherever you are, there is your movement. I'm like go to follows you to the bathroom you know it's going to be with you in the kitchen it's going to be with you in the gym it's going to be with you when you're sleeping like this is a, a way for you to frame your entire um, body as it moves through physical space in all in all environments in all the ways that you do and it's going to give you that framework and people haven't been introduced to the concept of mo movement they haven't been introduced to the concept of like you know what they're doing and they have a choice as you know if they can do this or if they can do that from the smallest of things i can brush my teeth here in the back chain or i can be brushing my teeth in you know in the front chain or i've got options i don't have to be sitting in the chair i can be sitting you know in the deep squat or uh so many different areas so trying to pull someone who like sees this as like oh this is exercise like yes it's exercise but this is a this is a whole understanding about this is I'm trying to help you figure out how to move your body, how to like operate your body as if you would teach someone how to drive a car. You know, this is we can take the car to the racetrack and go for that. We can take the car on a nice cruise down the, the countryside. We can do all that. But the whole time we're still driving and the same principles apply, whether you're doing a race at the track, whether you're doing a cruise down the highway or you're just going to the grocery store for a routine, you know, drive to the local market. Yeah, I mean, like most but, people uh, haven't been taught how to move properly since they were like, or taught how to move anything, and like since they were taught how to walk as a baby, and most people weren't even taught that right. So, thinking thinking about how yeah, to change well, the operating I would argue, system of moving, I would argue, I would argue against that um, because people weren't taught how to walk or or, yeah, or I crawl. guess that's true. <laughs> that's true they which is which is the own, which to me is the craziest thing that i've been trying to have this conversation is like yo like we all did this at one time we all recoded ourselves and no one told us how to do it we just figured it out we figured out the back chain we figured out the strong side of the foot we learned how to crawl from an out to in pattern and then eventually we built ourselves up to where we could stand on two feet like one of the most mir miraculous um things in the movement world in the animal world is bipedal like sprinting like a human being sprinting on two feet the amount of technical like evolutionary things that had to happen that a human being an animal could be on two feet and just like dead ass sprint and then go swim in the water and then climb trees is like it's astounding and it, you know and we don't really understand that but if you think about it like if there was a bear that stood on two feet we know that's scary like what were the bears on his two feet or you see on instagram like oh my goodness the dog's walking on his two feet like there's a certain a lure that we have to bipedal walking because we know that we run we won the lottery ticket when it comes to movement and this golden lottery ticket which is just walking and running which is a birthright for everybody not only is it a birthright but it's something that we, we taught ourselves how to do um innately there goes our yeah so um how much do you, how much have you dove into the Fibonacci sequence and the, and the math behind Gota? Cause, uh, you know, I know, I know that Gil mentions Fibonacci sequence, golden ratio and, and all that. Have you dove into that and, um, precisely to the math and then related that to your movement? Or is it more, we know that there's angles that you need to be in because we see it over and over and over again. And I'm just going to get to those angles and move. Yeah, it was, it was mostly like, I'm just going to get to those angles and move. And a big part of that was because I'm such a kinesthetic person. And once it was like, okay, logically I can, I can understand that. But then when I went to go walk and train these different angles, these different, you know, cornering ways, and I felt it in my body, I was like, okay, that's fine. 
I get it. It's it's right. And if I try and take that same understanding to everything, no one punches like this. Everyone loads out. Look, it's on this little it's on this little twenty two over there, and then it punches in. Now it's on a twenty two that 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 way. And even if it wasn't, like let's say, you know, it's just an out to in. You can simplify this, or you can expound on it as much as you need. I think personally, I would like to deep dive into the the mathematics of it, so I could have that conversation. If somebody did want to have that conversation, I would like there to be data. So if somebody want to have that conversation, we can have that conversation. Um, you know, but someone for me who's like a, a field person and every single time that I would punch since I was 15, they told me, hey, on the back foot, spin your heel out, you know, back foot, spin your heel, out, spin your heel. out. So these principles, when you look at any other movement system like martial arts, um, parkour, anything that is like based on movement, it's not based on literature, it's not based on studies. They teach go to principles to some degree because naturally they're going to come to the same similar conclusions. And then if you come to the same conclusions within your own body based upon feel, you come to the same conclusions based on visually, and then you get um, another mathematical kind of way of describing it that gives you uh, another further awareness and, and conclusion to like, oh, yeah, I, I see this everywhere. Um, I didn't find the need to go deep within the mathematics because also I don't like sitting down and writing and <laughs> looking at like people are like hey have you seen the study i'm like hey uh thank you for saying to me i ain't reading it like i don't do podcasts <laughs> right now like like listening to podcasts i rarely watch tv i'm not gonna spit like i sat a lot in school you know against my will doing homework and all that stuff now i want to be outside moving now i want to be doing creative stuff i want to be doing something that like really makes me feel happy and joyful and excited stoked on life um Maybe one day it will be the mathematics. I just ran into a mathematician, and uh, but I want to have a conversation with a mathematician. I don't want to pretend like I'm the mathematician. I want to see like, hey, can you explain this to me in a, in a stupid way? I didn't even graduate high school. Help me out here, kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, that's amazing. We're we're coming up on the hour mark here, and I just wanted to ask a question that we actually had from some people who I said, hey, what, what should we ask, Bam? Uh, the biggest question that we get just from outside, from people listening to our podcast is like, Hey, we love you talking about all the GoTo stuff. We love getting all the GoTo coaches. I just don't know where to start. Where do I start with GoTo? I can't afford a coach. Um, how do I get started? And I always tell them, well, I'm not a coach, so I can't actually tell you how to do that. Um, I usually just send them to gotomovement.com. But for, for anyone who's like totally new to the concepts, they kind of have a vague awareness of the, the universal principles of movement and posture. What's the best starting place for someone who just wants to get started with Goda? I uh, just get started with Goda. Uh, do exactly what I did. Find somebody who's teaching Goda. Send them a message and be like, "Do you do online training, or are you in my local area?" That was the first question that that I sent to Gil. Um, it wasn't like, "Hey, can you give me some more supportive information? Do you have any like things that I can kind of do?" I was like, "No, like I need this in my life." Uh, this is information that's going to really help me, benefit me, and uh, can I work with you? And there's a lot of coaches right now that are available to work, that want to have the conversation with you, that are willing to give you their time at a very, very cheap price uh, for what the information they're giving you. And what's great is you can do this on Zoom. Uh, like I said, I did it with Gil. He put his he put his phone down in in the hallway and was like back 20 feet when I, in 2019, just yelling at the, at the phone. I could barely see him. Like what you need to do is get inside ankle bone high. And it was just like yelling at me like in, inside ankle bone high, inside ankle bone high technology. Like, do I got to buy something? Like what's happening? But it's just that it was a translation of information and awareness that I was not privy to that I had not ever been exposed to. And so just by having a conversation with a go-to coach, they're going to expose you to some very powerful tools that are very easily understood, very easily applied to your life in all aspects. Um, and even just doing one session, two sessions, getting a slow motion video assessment is going to start you on this path of, of it's, a, it's a paradigm shift of, okay, this I'm not in muscle building uh, exercise uh, culture and focus anymore, but I'm in, I am an energetic body that's moving through time and space. And I would like to know how to move my body. And so I need to know, I need to have somebody who knows how to look at how I'm moving and can help me and say, Hey, these are the ways that we need you to improve. So I, you know, 
hire a girl to coach. You know, you don't got to go through hire. even a full recode. Just hot, yeah. Just have somebody like, yo, can you just look at my movement? I'll pay you a hundred bucks or something like that. Just look at my movement and tell me how I can improve and what I need. And they're gonna be like, yo, like your feet are crap. Like get that shit straight. <laughs> Or they're going to be like, yeah, you need some back chain length. You're missing that. Or, hey, this is good. Your spine's a little locked up. They're going to give it to you straight uh, because they care about you. And that information is priceless. I mean, coaches do catch things that you will never be able to see yourself. Like, if you're, even if you, like, I did all the DIY courses. I took your locomotion course, the locomotion drill course, which is awesome. Um, you know, I did the decompression course, the go to uh, pre movement fundamentals. Um, you know, I did all the, I did all the, do it yourself stuff, the recode225.com workouts. But I still get messages from go to coaches all the time when I post my stuff up, be like, hey, you're out of your columns. Like, hey, like your ankle bones dropping when you pick up the the energy too much. Mm -hmm. Co coaches just have an eye, a trained eye for this, that, that they'll be able to see stuff that you will not be able to see yourself. So if someone wants to reach out to you and be like, yo, help me out, I want to start the conversation, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Um, on, you know, just go to my Instagram, in my Instagram, in my bio, there's a little link page, a little link tree. You click on that. It says schedule a session with Bam. You schedule me. And then we start having a conversation. Um, and you know, I, I can't, I can't really stress that because even when you're working with a coach, like, like you're saying, Anthony, you might be doing Rico 225 or, or one of the, one of the different courses that we had, you know, even that is still in a mindset of exercise exercise fitness you know recoding mindset there's a lot of times where i have a conversation with somebody of course we go over recode we go over slow motion and video assessment but then i might ask some questions like how much do you sit every day and no one has ever asked them that in their life and they're like Phew. and i'm like come on like right now like how many hours and like like give it to me and they're like six to eight hours in a day i'm like okay i could give you an hour recode two hour recode but now we're fighting also a six to eight hour sitting time where you're just hanging out in these postures that are doing the exact opposite of your one hour recode. So what's going to be more impactful in this person's life? Trying to change their movement behaviors like at home, in their waiting, resting, in their work, in their work life or getting them to do rockers, wall sits and this, you know, consistently. Obviously, it's both. But sometimes a go to coach is going to be able to look at the overall global qualities and shapes and environments that you put yourself in and say, this thing right here, if we eliminated that on the other side of that is going to be a lot more high quality movement, a lot less pain, um, a lot more improvement in just your overall physical being. Um, and sometimes that's not a specific exercise or specific program, but it's an awareness on something that you are or not doing that could really drastically change your life. So in short, get a fucking coach. Go reach out to Bam. You can check him out on at go to Bam on Instagram. You can shoot him a message. Go to the link tree and uh, go book a session with Bam today. Bam, thanks so much for coming to hang out with us on the podcast today, man. This has been uh, super insightful. Yeah. It's really cool hearing your story too. Yeah, we should definitely do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate we'll you up. coming on. Cool. That's amazing. And for you guys right, who are ciao. listening on iTunes and Spotify, thank you so much for listening. You can always catch these live on nofilter.net where you can also see the video replays. Uh, no Filter is a spot where you can actually ask questions in real time and join the stream directly if you actually want to interact with us, interact with us in person, kind of. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. This was episode 41. We'll catch you next time. Have a good one, guys.